Yeah, I was a graduate student at Oxford University as of 1965, and he was an uh, undergraduate uh, in uh, Oxford uh, doing Hebrew and archaeology, I think. Uh, and uh, we met and talked several times. We attended one class where there were only two students, he and me. He and I were the students, and the professor was one of the greatest Islamists of the 20th century, Samuel Nicholas Stern. And we were doing this conquest of Islam, reading the text about the Arabic text about the conquest of Islam, of Spain by Islam. I mean, that's what I remember. He was a, a prince. Uh, he had an open Mercedes car, or two of them actually, and we used to watch him go around, he, he would wave to me. I mean, we were friends, but I ha didn't see him for 40 years, and it was only thanks to this conference that I, we reintroduced each other. To, to and you recognized people. each other as well, didn't I, you? I mean, he is, um, but he, the amazing thing is that a simple person like me was recognized by him, and he said, you are Sasson Samer, isn't that? I was born uh, in Baghdad, 1933. Um, at that, uh, my father was uh, and mother were graduates of uh, Alliance School, where they spoke English and French. My mother didn't even learn to write or read Arabic, but she read them all her life in English and French. Uh, and um, I was born in. Uh, I grew up in a very secular uh, atmosphere. My parents were t t totally secular. It had nothing to do, no Hebrew book or the Bible. The Hebrew Bible didn't exist in our home. Uh, because we uh, belonged to a generation where uh, I call them the middle class, uh, Jewish, Iraqi Jewish middle class, who were totally secular. The whole, m our uh, neighborhood uh, quarter was 90% Jewish. 10% mixed Christians and Muslims, and there wasn't one single synagogue in our area. I mean, that's in the past when they built a Jewish quarter, there were 10 synagogues. For every 50 family, 50 households, uh, there is a synagogue. Uh, not in our area. And uh, so I never learned Hebrew, uh, um, I mean, old Hebrew. And that actually helped me when I arrived in Israel. I knew no Hebrew whatever, and while others who went to Hebrew schools or learned some prayer Hebrew, uh, pronounced the Hebrew in a distorted way, in an Iraqi way, not the way it's spoken today in Palestine, in Israel. Uh, so for me, I, I was, was tabula rasa. For them, they had to erase what they learned, and it was a difficult, very horrible, horribly difficult uh, process. Uh, to erase what they knew. So I was lucky because I arrived in Israel, so much so that in three, four years I was, after my arrival, I was writing in Hebrew press, in Hebrew. Uh, and they couldn't uh, extract themselves from what uh, they learned before. I arrived at the age of 17. I already regarded myself as an Arab writer. I wrote poetry. Uh, in uh, traditional Arabic prosody and things like that. I even published a few poems in Baghdad. When I arrived in Israel, that was the literature I claimed to represent. And uh, there were very few intellectuals among the Arabs of Israel, uh, three, four, mostly Jew Christians, like Emil Habibi. Uh, and they were all more or less communists. I joined them. I was. Uh, uh, right away accepted as a member of the editorial board of the uh, Al Jadid, the month, only monthly literary journal in Israel. I wrote there about uh, um, the Hebrew literature, about Arabic literature. I was always wanted to introduce each other uh, to the other people, uh, people uh, literature. Uh, then I studied in uh, the Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University, Hebrew University, Hebrew linguistics. Hebrew linguistics, not Arabic, because in Tel Aviv University there was no department of Arabic as yet. I established it several years later when I came back from uh, Oxford. 
eventually I went to Oxford to do Arabic uh, because I was told that there's a very good scholar, a young Egyptian scholar, who uh, was employed for the first time in the history of Oxford University to teach modern Arabic. I mean, the professors of Arabic only dealt with the ancient. And he was Mustafa Badawi, Egyptian, a graduate of this, you know, I did his PhD here in uh, Cambridge. Anyhow, he, uh, he became my friend, my supporter. Uh, I wrote my thesis about Nagib Mahfouz, and I was lucky, like, I don't know how to say, lucky, because when I uh, selected Nagib Mahfouz as a topic of my thesis, he was um, in the middle. He wasn't the f f most famous or most important Arab writer. He was a good writer. Uh, when under me, <laughs> I published the first book in English about Nagib Mahfouz in 1973, that was my thesis, and it stayed the only book in a Western language until he received his Nobel Prize. So all the scholars who came after me had to start with me. <laughs> I mean, my book became uh, kind of a point of departure to all the Mahfuzology. Um, Worse than that, worse than that, <laughs> Nagib Mahfouz claims that it's only th thanks to me that he received the Nobel Prize because <laughs> the Nobel Prize quoted from my book, the Nobel Prize Committee, uh, and there was nothing else to quote. I was, uh, that, that's why I'm saying I'm lucky rather than better, good. You know, the university traditions, a, a, a real university must have uh, the Arabic department, uh, also to augment Hebrew, because Hebrew uh, scholars of Hebrew need uh, plenty of Arabic in order to proceed with their uh, research. So it was a part of, uh, I mean, I was very encouraged to leave Hebrew. I was in the middle of doing a PhD in Hebrew, and I was encouraged by my university to go over to Oxford. They paid for it, it, uh, it was also an Aki. And I, in three years, I came back with a PhD in Arabic, modern Arabic literature. And uh, that's when the department was started. The, all, all dep uh, the only department that existed before that was the Hebrew University, which was a part of the original Hebrew University established in 1925. By, by, by Buber? Uh, by Buber and others. Uh, yeah, Buber was, uh, uh, Magnus actually was. The trends are okay. I think uh, there are many scholars and professors of Arabic in Israel who love the language, who love it. They are not uh, orientalistic types. They don't look at it from above. But, on the, <coughs> but it's the problem, the big problem is, is the people of Israel, the students and their parents. Their parents think that Arabic is not a, a very important, it's not an international language, it's a local what would you do with that? If you, uh, it's, isn't, if you are doing a language, why not do French or English, for example? That's the argument they proceed with. Uh, and uh, so they don't encourage their students, uh, their children to study Arabic, to, uh, to specialize in Arabic studies. And the worse than that, that uh, Arabic is taught in Israel uh, in high schools in high schools as a second foreign language. First uh, foreign language is English. Arabic is second foreign language, but it's not a compulsory thing. So 90% of the families don't encourage their, their, their children to take Arabic. So we have um, a minority, small minority who can read and write Arabic in Israel, although the government would pay, I mean, I'm just, even the government, which is not very crazy about the Arabs, but it will pay as many children, uh, teachers we need in Arabic, but there isn't a demand. Uh, so they, if they are taking a third language, it will be French most of the time. Yeah, but I don't think that's a crucial difference uh, because students who turn scholars in eventually are normally uh, brought to love this uh, the topic by a great uh, teacher, by someone with charisma. My interest uh, 
happened when I went to study with a blind person by the name of Chaim Blank. He was American. He came to Israel without knowledge of Arabic to fight the 1948 war. And two weeks after his arrival, he lost his eyes. Then he started learning Arabic to become, to my mind, the greatest Arabist of all generations. He was something unbelievable. He changed the methods used by, uh, by he, he dealt with spoken Arabic of Iraq and Egypt, and he changed the uh, philosophy of this topic, uh, dialectology, uh, because he ins introduced a, a new thinking about it's not a matter of geography. Dialectology is normally treated as a matter of, but he also brought in the case of Baghdadi Jews, as ha so happened, I, this is my dialect, that the Jews speak one dialect, the Muslims speak another. And nobody understands, this is not found anywhere else in the world, that for it can happen for 50 years, there is immigration, and the second generation will acquire the majority language. In this case, it went on for 500 years. Nobody understood this uh, phenomenon. He uh, was, with his blindness, he was able to solve the problem for, now it's a part of the dialectology science, this kind of thing, because there are some uh, religious and other matters that uh, can be as strong and as crucial as uh, the geography. Politically speaking, uh, the, this the problem of Arab Jews uh, took different shapes uh, among the Arabs, the Arab neighbors of Israel. First of all, they were treated as traitors, although we were basically thrown out of, uh, with the Zionist encouragement, but also the Arabs helped them to throw us out. And then uh, at, at later on, suddenly they, they started calling us Arab Jews for the first time in the 1960s, I think. And they're saying, wow, now the Iraqis are saying, for example, how stupid we are. The, these Jews built Iraq in the interwar period. They were the most intelligent uh, 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 government officials, the minister of finance was Jewish, etc., etc. And we threw them, to Israel took them, and they built Israel instead of building Iraq. Now, one of them, Khalid Khashteni, was supposed to be in this conference. He wrote an article in uh, his journal, Sharq al Awsat, this is the one uh, Saudi newspaper appearing in London, and he says it's called it This Blessed Community. That's the title. He said, Look, Iraq, now that Iraq is becoming, uh, coming back to itself after the uh, removal of Saddam, uh, let's call the Jews of Iraq to come back and help us build a new healthy, uh, democratic country together. So I called him, he uh, happens to be a, my, one of my best friends, said, Khaled, are you crazy? Where are these Jews? They're no more of them. They're all dead. I'm, I'm the last Arab Jew living. I mean, I'm, that's not true. There are a few hundreds more. But I'm saying I'm the last Jew. My children have nothing to do with Iraq. They speak Hebrew. Their mother is, is uh, Ashkenazi, she's American, as you see. Not only me, everyone. That's the that's rule of the game. There is no more Arab Jews in Israel. And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> you, are, you, you are very dynamic, my, you have a dynamic mind. How didn't you think about this uh, change? Anyhow, this is uh, uh, occurring. But the answer to this is that really we, there are no Arab Jews anymore. Finished. I mean, there are some people who still speak at home, maybe the local dialect, Morocco or something like that. But basically, it's not a, a, a whole quarter of a million Jews using it as a literary language, as an uh, administrative language. They only use it at home, and there are very few, say, out of this quarter million, probably now they add to up to half a million because of the... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I think you would find 5,000 people who speak uh, Judeo-Arabic and not Arabic, not written Arabic. So I don't think that the Arabs are, uh, they are aware of it. I mean, in the far past they couldn't care less. But now they're saying all these Judeo-Arabs, uh, maybe also they 
they, a change will happen in Israel thanks to their pressure that Israel becomes more open to Arab uh, uh, life and Arab minds, etc. But it's not happening. I mean, the Arabs discover that it's uh, not a very good idea. That it won't give any uh, outcome, not uh, give any results. Um, so it is an idea. As I said, Khaled Khishteni wrote an article. He told me that he received 50 letters of uh, cursing him for saying that. But he is a leader. He's a, a very uh, intelligent mind, and he wrote it. So it's not, doesn't, it's not taking shape as a big rolling idea that's c gathering force. And, and it didn't, doesn't look like that, unfortunately. Professor Samech, thank you very much. Thank you very much.